President Obama was recently seen carrying a biography of President Ronald Reagan. Was he just being nostalgic or looking for some lessons from a past president? I'm joined by someone who helped write the original Reagan playbook. Ken Duberstein was President Reagan's chief of staff. He now runs the Duberstein Group. Mr. Duberstein, welcome to Bottom Line. Good to have you on. It's great to be with you, Mark. Sir, before he left on a year on vacation, we all know that you and David Gergen spoke to President Obama. The president wanted to talk to you guys, and he wanted to at least get a sense from two men who were intim intimately involved in two presidencies. I know because the, the conversation was private, you cannot discuss what you said, okay. but can you give us a sense of the broad strokes that Mr. Obama is going to have to paint tonight if he's going to have to get some consensus in this country to govern and to move us forward towards a stronger and faster economic recovery? Great question. What he has to do tonight, following in the Reagan mold, is very much speak about optimism, about his faith in the future, about this, the faith of the American people to get things done right. You know, there's one thing to look back, America always looks forward. He always, Ronald Reagan always talked about hope, not fear, about possibility, not probability. Mm -hmm. So the answer is the president has to be all inclusive. The president has to unlike the first two years where he talked about building a consensus in Washington, whether it was on health care or financial services reform, now has to talk about building a consensus in America. Was that and then Washington will follow. And that, was that then, perhaps as I talked to Melody Barnes earlier, but maybe another tactical mistake of the administration? It's not about here in the Beltway, it's about everybody else outside of the Beltway? The American people think they have a special bond with whomever is president. Barack Obama was very popular. People are rooting for him. People like Barack Obama. They may not like his policies. Mm. What he has to do is get out from the sausage making of Washington so that outside the beltway, speak and listen to the American people and form a consensus there. That strengthens his case here in Washington. But as, but as you well know, yeah. because President Obama had said this, and, and I believe that President Reagan said it too, when you're in the old office, when you're in the White House, you're, you're caught in a bubble, and you don't get out as often as you did perhaps when you were on the campaign trail. You obviously have duties, you have obligations, you're governing, and you can't govern while you're out in public. The decisions are made in the Oval Office with your inner circle and with, with your cabinet. How can President Obama get out and about more and deliver that message of optimism to the American people? I think with, with the appointment of Bill Daley as Chief of Staff, with a reworked White House uh, staff, he has the people in place who can work with Capitol Hill, who can work with the media, who can do the outreach that is necessary so that it will free him to work on the consensus with the American people by traveling, by listening, by participating very much in the process, mm -hmm. but not the sausage making process, the process of public opinion, of shaping views, of speaking to the higher needs of the American people, not to this congressional district, but to America as large. Look, he is the embodiment of America right now. He's the president of the United States. Everybody puts their faith in him they want him to choose widely. The number one issue is jobs. Yeah. The number one issue is, is unemployment. Focus on job creation for today and in the future, yeah. rather than looking back or looking at you know, this markup session in the Congress or, right. or something like that. Um, you recently mentioned in a Bloomberg article that it appears President Obama wants to govern, quote, much more inclusively. What did you mean by that? In the first two years, I think he was missing building bridges to the business community, to the Republicans on Capitol Hill because they were in the minority, to the media. But you know, the White House's response is that the president reached out a hand of bipartisanship and got it slapped back, which is why they went ahead with health care reform alone, which is why they did financial regulatory reform alone, because they didn't feel they had a willing partner. Well, and I think they had a willing partner. It's about how to go about doing it. One of the points that I have made consistently is that in the first two years, 
you can put, count on two hands the number of Republican offices <laughs> that the staff of the White House visited. The answer is you got to get to know people. You have to build a coalition every time. And, and you I, have to reach out. And, 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 and I don't mean to interrupt right. you, but that brings to mind the relationship between Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. They were ideologically about as far apart you as you it. can get. Why did they get along so well? How were they able to form bridges and to get jobs you know, done? You know, Tip O'Neill used to say, I don't like compromising with Ronald Reagan, because every time I compromise with President Reagan, President Reagan gets 80% of what he wants. <laughs> and President Reagan's answer was, I will take 80% every time and come back the next year for the additional 20. That's what governing is all about. What I saw in the lame duck session of Congress this past November and December got a lot done, was 80%. Yeah. That's what governing is about. That's not campaigning. Well, that was the, that was the phrase when the Obama White House was saying not to let the uh, perfect stand in the way of the good. And that is the 80% solution. And that is what governing, I think, is all about. I think Bill Clinton understood it. Ronald Reagan certainly made it a high art form. And I think that it's something that President Obama is doing or gonna, going to do as he confronts a Republican Congress. There are many areas where I think he can work hand in glove with the Republicans, not all. Such as? Deficit reduction. He can do far more in deficit reduction than he could have with Nancy Pelosi as Speaker but, of the House. But his own deficit reduction commission back in December couldn't get a supermajority. But I think there are many elements of that deficit reduction proposal that the president will embrace. But remember, no matter who's running the Congress, it takes presidential leadership. Trade, a Korea free trade agreement, and Panama, and Colombia. It'll be much easier for the president to get with a Republican control than a Democratic Speaker Pelosi dominated House. What don't the financial markets want to hear tonight? What they don't want to hear is more uncertainty. They don't want to hear of any new spending proposals or major tax increases. They don't want to hear about a regulatory uh, program that if you can't get it through Congress, we'll regulate it. That's the last thing that they want to hear. But the, what White, they want the White is, House's response to that was the reason that we got into this mess. Part of the reason was because there wasn't enough regulation. And last week they announced that they were going to take a look at all regulations to see whether or not they produced jobs and were not uh, anti-competitive. The Jeff Immelt appointment mm -hmm. goes very much in that direction as well. The White House seems to be getting the idea that, unlike what Melanie Bourne said, the government doesn't create jobs, the private sector creates jobs. And I think that is one of the things that the president needs to convey tonight, his understanding of the fund fundamental role of small business and large corporations on the job situation. In our last 90 seconds, a lot has been made about tone in Washington following that horrific shooting in Tucson on January 8th. Right. Is tone more of a problem now than it was when you were in the Reagan White House? Yes. For the simple reason that now everybody questions everybody else's motives. You can disagree when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. They used to argue like mad, but then they had a drink at 6 o'clock at night. <laughs> the trouble is now, if you have an R on your forehead, you don't talk to the Ds. And the Ds don't talk to the Rs. Or if you do, you shoot at one another. Yeah. And you don't listen. And the more we can get people to stop shouting, whether it's on TV or on the floor of the house, and listen to one another, the more we can build some consensus. Last 20 seconds, that idea by Senator Udall to perhaps have some folks sit together, is that a good idea or is it just superficial? I think the symbolism is terrific. Is it symbolism it, this country needs right now? It is symbolism the country needs. It is a start, but it's, it's deeds, not just actions of, of sitting together in a ceremony. All right, Ken Duberstein, a former chief of staff to President Ronald Reagan, joining us here in Washington. It's a pleasure My to meet pleasure, you, sir. Mark. Thank you very much. Good I seeing appreciate you, Mark. It.